Okay, but if this was a data breach, you wouldn't have a choice, and it would be a whole lot worse. Yeah, it's kind of like all the people that said, we can't work from home. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs. And joining me is Donna Grindle of Carton. Good morning, Donna. We're getting song out of you this morning. You never know, man. You just never know. I know. Yep. That's why we could be having a long conversation. Then we go into the show, and I never know what you're going to say, what mood you're going to be in. Could be completely different. The The fun part about it is I don't know what I'm going to say or what mood I'm going to be in either. Yeah. I, I always <laughs> say that. I, I learn what I'm going to say when I open my mouth. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's kind of one of those things where you just take a deep breath and then just go <laughs> just dive into the cold water and go so yes. yeah, that's what we're gonna go. do but uh today we're going to talk about the cost of a data breach from the new 2021 report something that we do every year covering the cost of a data breach because uh, often that's a question we get i actually was on a podcast the other day and the question came up you know how much is the cost of a data breach and i said it's always a rising for most of part <laughs> <laughs> um you know it, it wasn't a, a it a, depends yeah that's it what wasn't we always a, say right and that's kind of my answer which i hate giving that answer but it wasn't a podcast specifically for a certain industry so it was like yeah it's you know, it's more for certain industries than others, and there's other things around that, which we've talked about before, about these are certain things you can do to to bring your cost down. There's certain things that you do or don't do that makes the cost go up. Mm-hmm. So, man, it's it's all over the place. But we'll cover we'll cover some of those today and talk about what it looks like this year versus last year. And uh, I think it's going to be enlightening. You definitely yeah. need to know what this information looks like for you. Uh, especially if you're the person that might be talking to leadership about your cybersecurity program or your your privacy and security program or whatever, because at the end of the day, these these are the numbers that get people's attention. Like, what is it going to cost us to ignore this? <laughs> yeah, that, that's <laughs> the key piece because this thing is we use it every year. I mean, it, you know, this thing's been around. Uh, This report we're going to talk about, this is the 17th one. Yeah. So, Which is good. We can follow the trends. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, All right. So for those of you who like today's episode, please share it out and uh, help us. Just just share with one person. Surely you know one person. I know. Everybody shared with one person. Everybody listening right now shared with one person. We can get paid. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about all that, but okay. <laughs> you got to remember now, uh, last week we said we were sharing uh, profits with George. And so right now I'm paying him nothing. So if we start making money, I have to pay him something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. When, you, when you're giving away percentages of nothing, it's really easy to do. I know. Isn't it though? Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, I'll give every, everybody can have equity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go. good. So um, if you do like today's episode, again, share it out and uh, join us at helpmewithhippa.com. If you want to look at ways that you can donate to the podcast or if you want to look at today's show notes and there's always good stuff in the show notes. And also we have an app. We hadn't mentioned that in a while. We do have an yeah. app, which the app has some cool little features to it too. Not just the ability to listen, but also you can download some things to use for training. Well, you get your training documentation because if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Ain't that true? You got to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> See, not only one breaking out in song. There you go. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, bub. All right, let's get uh, rolling. So, cost of data breach report. So, yes, as she mentioned, seventeenth year the annual cost of data breach study has come out, and we'll have links to this in the show notes. And it is our custom, as is our custom, <laughs> we review it and we update all our records. And, you know, it's always helpful uh, because it provides stats that we need to make decisions. And, you know, 
planning and all that good stuff. So let's see what mm-hmm. that's going to look like. Well, right off the bat, we know. Healthcare. <laughs> Healthcare. <laughs> you always win. I know. In a bad it's, way. It's, yeah, it's, we're number one. <laughs> <laughs> it's Gosh not, darn it. <laughs> not the right competition to be number one in. But yes, <laughs> healthcare is number one. Not yeah. at all. So, 11th year to rope. Wow. Yeah. I think it's 11 out of the 17 for sure. But, you know, when you look at the big picture and the things that we talk about, uh, it, it there's reasons why. But uh, the uh, quote, that I picked up on here. Healthcare data breach cost increased the total, the total average. So total average. In 2020, when they did the report in 2020, that report said it was 7.13 million. Mm-hmm. Boom. Cause this one is 9.23 million. And I, oh, wow. I love the fact that they do a 29.5% increase. Can we just say 30%? <laughs> uh, mm, yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. And and then they point out right after that that the energy sector actually decreased. Well, we know that's not going to be the case for 2021, don't we? <laughs> Can you say colonial pipeline? But needless to say, what we look at when we're looking at this report and and it gets back to your question that you were posed is what does it cost? And it's directly related to the records that you have, the number of them and the value of them. So every year I take the lowest number on the list. What's the lowest per record cost? Mm -hmm. I remember that one. And I remember the healthcare one. And I say, well, it's somewhere between these two. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and if if you don't if you don't feel uh, comfortable with the numbers, cut the bottom number by twenty five percent. Just pick a number in these ranges. You know, yeah. they've only been doing it for seventeen years. They kind of have the math down, right? And a lot of people say, "Well, that's not what it costs." But these take into account soft costs, not just hard costs. That yeah. takes into account downtime and loss of resources and compliance and those kind of things that yeah. make it expensive. That, and that's the part that most people don't understand and actually made this point on that podcast, which is, you know, you can look at how much does the breach cost as far as paying ransoms or not, or getting people in to remediate and getting things back in business. And all those things are hard cost. They're easy to measure. What's hard to measure is the soft cost of the damage to your brand Mm -hmm. or how much money you you've lost during that downtime because people weren't doing business with you. Those are some subjective numbers, but oftentimes it's more expensive than the hard costs. Oh, very often. And you don't realize what a resource drain these cases are Mm -hmm. that your people and your company, they're either slowed down on the jobs they can do, they can't do their job, or they're sucked out of their job into dealing with the problem. Yeah. That's why I always think it's funny when you mention something to somebody like doing an, an audit and like a deep audit, one yeah. that's going to be a bit disruptive. Yeah. You know, and oh, we don't have time to do that. We can't be that's too putting expensive. resources toward that. Yeah. We, we're too busy. I'm like, okay, but if this was a data breach, you wouldn't have a choice and it would be a whole lot worse. Yeah, it's kind of like all the people that said, we can't work from home. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, uh, um, it's funny. My, my wife used to work for a company and that was, you know, the CEO is like, you know, nobody shall ever work from home. It, it's not possible. And, you know, now everybody's working from home. <laughs> it's amazing yeah. what becomes possible when it has to be done. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, and that's exactly the scenario that you end up in when you're in a data breach. Mm-hmm. I just don't, for people, yeah, I don't get it. So when we look at the per record numbers, last year 
the low end was 146 per record. Okay. It's now gone up to 161. Got a raise. <laughs> Bad guys got a raise. I know. The criminals are taking the victims for more money and costing them money. Because all of this money doesn't go to the criminals. And a lot of people think of it just in that way. But, you know, the health care number is, you know, irrelevant at some point is what I say. Because... Most of the groups that I work with, I say, let's just take the bottom number. Let's don't even let's don't even look at the the, yeah, total the terrible for, stuff. Yeah, <laughs> let's let's just look at the bottom number. And if you're in healthcare and you're of any size and you have, let's say, even a thousand patient records mm -hmm. times one sixty one. Mm, let me carry to one. 161,000. <laughs> <laughs> uh, times pi. And uh, so, yep. uh, but when you look at those numbers, and, you know, healthcare organizations have way more than 1,000 records. I mean, even oh, the yeah. small ones, yeah. right? So they're going to have 5,000, let's say. All right, well, now mm -hmm. you've, you're really starting to get into some numbers here. And when you get all the way up into, uh, you know, any medium size, not even medium. I mean, you're talking uh, a small rural town practice. They probably have eighty to 100,000 patients on file. Mm-hmm. You know, somewhere in that. Yeah. Okay. Here, Do the math. The other, thing, the other thing to consider when you're having this conversation is a lot of times people say, well, it's going to be, let's just throw a number out there. It's going to be $500,000 when I do this calculation, and I've got insurance that will cover that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I have to laugh because you don't know necessarily if the insurance is going to cover it. Oftentimes, you don't know what they're going to cover. Yep. They could come up and ask you to prove you're doing certain things that would have limited your risk and liability, which you may or may not know about. Which you mm -hmm. probably should know about beforehand because <laughs> I've seen these <laughs> things happen. And then the other thing is they're often not covering some of these soft costs we're talking about. They may cover the hard costs, mm -hmm. the soft costs, maybe not. Again, that's there's a lot of ifs. Well, you know, and you've about, got your $50,000 deductible, and yeah. then you've got your, you know, the costs that are just like you said, they, they lost business isn't covered in a lot of things. Yeah, but even let's just say it is because, you know, you and I like to kind of give the best case scenario. We're not the the FUD people, but mm. let's say that you're no down. No matter for, what people say, we're not. We're fun, not FUD. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, let's say you're down for two mm. weeks, okay, which is probably a bare minimum, but you're down for two weeks. Let's say the insurance does cover all the business you lost for two weeks. Do you think at the two week mark that all of a sudden business is going to just be right back to normal? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a number of patients that will never come back to you. There's damage that's done, you know, for long periods of time that insurance is not going to cover. Yep. And there's a lot of time where you're in there and you say, well, this year we're going to accomplish A, B, and C, and we're going to expand into this. And that's part of your business plan. That gets shot out the window. Dude, 2020 shot all of my business plans out the window. Yeah. I yeah, I have a slide about 2020 that has business plan going to shredder. That's it. Yeah, That's I, 2020. Yeah. And the sad thing about it is, you know, we had plans basically for the next three years. It, it just, all of them's gone. Yeah. Because it changed yeah. so much. <laughs> it's just like, okay. You know, it's not like you can say, all right, let's 2021, let's do what we're going to do in 2020, because now it's everything's yeah. different. The focus is different. The people's challenges are different. So it's like, oh, I got to start yeah. over. You, you get the eraser out. <laughs> I know. It's like, <laughs> all right, that crystal ball didn't work. Let's try this one. <laughs> so if you look at how everything had to transition to 2020 and the attacks became more plentiful, and our vulnerabilities opened wide up because last year's report, they took into account that they were anticipating additional cost 
because of all the remote workers. And guess what? <laughs> they were right. They were. Yes. So, needless to say, there's not surprises in here as far as the findings and the numbers that reflect what all we've been through as we have thrown everything out and started over. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the same numbers, the same big impacts that they uh, recognize is what's the biggest impact for making the, the breaches less expensive and what's the biggest impacts for making them worse. That's what we've always looked at. And then mm -hmm. I show people, like, when I'm making my recommendations, that's mm -hmm. why. <laughs> Where'd you get this stuff, Donna? Is that yeah. just, just your good idea? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how do you set priorities? Well, let me show you some numbers because I am a math and science nerd. If it's got numbers, I'm going to analyze them. I can't control myself. I'm like, how right. did that get there? Let me see where mm -hmm. that came from. I'd like to know how they calculated that. So, what are the most frequent initial attack vectors? Well, you love the attack vectors. <laughs> if you have the any, let's just say any type of uh, controls in place, do you think that these attack vectors really are protecting you uh, in the first place? Because a lot of people just say, well, I don't have to, you know, there's no sense in doing this because, you know, they're going to get me anyway or everybody's out there. And it's really not true. Mm -mm. And But as we have often said, uh, that <laughs> when you... Uh, evaluate things there's a lot of times a person involved oh yeah it's like i always say it's either because somebody did something they shouldn't have or uh -huh. they didn't do something they should have had <laughs> exactly so <laughs> and and so that's that's how we look at it from you know those initial attack vectors same thing my guess is uh you know the business well they call it, you know, the nerd speak is BEC. Right. Yeah. Business email compromise. Yeah. Which is, you know, still a big thing. And I know. Uh, the thing about a lot of the conversation, and, and we're certainly in, in that boat, we've had a lot of conversation lately about ransomware. It's all in the news. And I guess to, to some degree, we're part of the news, quote unquote. <laughs> but it's it does oftentimes take the eye off of the other balls that are having to be juggled. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk so much about ransomware and then people might think, well, I guess business email compromise isn't a problem anymore because you hadn't heard about it. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's rolls off everybody's head business email compromise. Yeah. Cause it's like, well, what is that? I mean, for you know us in it, you, we uh, may understand it better, but often people are like, I don't, I don't understand what you mean by that or how can that happen? And, uh, I, I was, Reading the thread just the other day, Donna, you'll love this. Uh -oh. An IT, an IT guy, you know, he's got a company, but he says, "Can this is an IT thread? Can somebody tell me how I have a client who has business email compromise on a multi-factor account?" Well, and an SMS. So, well, this it went down this whole rabbit hole of you know, basically people giving their opinions about how this can happen. There's some vulnerabilities out there that can cause it to happen. There's, you know, obviously using social engineering that can cause it to happen. But the, his point was, I've got security controls in place. I've got multi-factor authentication on the email. I've got them set up about as good as I can get it. And somebody still got into the business email account. Uh, My guess is it was wow. SMS because you really shouldn't do I mean, it's so easy to trick those yeah. phones these days, but. So anyway, I don't I don't know what happened, and he probably would end up having to get somebody else involved that can figure that out. I, I don't know, but you know the point being, we can't ignore all the other things just because ransomware is now the sexy let's talk about topic of the day. Yeah, oftentimes ransomware is successful because of these other things: business email compromise, social they engineering. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, the attack vectors, you know, they're all... So the most expensive attack initial attack vector is business email compromise. Mm-hmm. The most likely is not the most expensive. The most likely is compromised credentials. <laughs> yeah. That's the easiest. Well, and why do you say easy, though? Uh, because uh, in general, people have terrible, terrible, terrible uh, password hygiene and management. There you go. So back to the same thing. Everybody's like, we got to get rid of passwords. Hmm. We can't even get people to use passwords managers, which essentially get rid of most passwords. Hmm. And and for some reason, I mean, if you would just use it properly. Yeah, that's the other big thing, right? Yeah. Oh, hmm. yeah. I've got it, but I don't put everything in it. Yeah. You know, well, and I can't remember how to get into it, so don't use it anymore. Mm-hmm. I saw a post on Facebook the other day and somebody copied me on it, but fortunately it was um it was an individual issue, not a company issue. So I said, No, I can give you some advice, but I can't help you. <laughs> but <laughs> it, somebody's teenage daughter had let them had let, you know, quote unquote Microsoft support enter their laptop. And, you know, oh. they were like, What what should I do? And it was funny how many IT people were coming up saying, well, we, you know, we work on stuff like that. And of course they're in the area and all that. And, and you know, a lot of them were talking about, you know, we just need to reinstall windows and all this. And I'm like, good thing y'all don't do business because that's not your first step. No. <laughs> Huge difference between somebody who is in IT residential type stuff and who's in business stuff who really knows what they're doing. But th- the funny thing was, they had let somebody in and they said, well, we're changing all of our passwords to everything and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, did you have a password manager like LastPass? Yeah. Okay. Does it log itself out or was it logged in as soon as you pull up your browser? Oh, it's, it's always logged in. We never have to type the password in. Uh, okay. Well, then they probably uh, exported your entire you know, list of things within a few minutes. and. Probably set up back doors and everything else. So you're, yeah. you know, good luck. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> yeah. Again, if you're going to use a password manager, you can't just, ins- this goes with almost any software. You can't just install it and yeah. use it. You have to configure it properly. Everything takes care and feeding. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it goes to the conversation Donna, you and I have had about the quote unquote HIPAA compliant software, which there's no such thing. It's HIPAA capable and i've seen people use that term yeah, and i like I'm it like it i'm liking uh, it a lot better yeah. than hipaa compliant right because hipaa compliant makes it sound like i install it and i'm good right all right hipaa capable is like okay it's capable of doing it but what, what do i have to do then there, there it right. gives the uh, assumption that i've got to do something it's capable yeah. of doing it but what do i have to do and yeah. so that's i love it a lot more and it's kind of like saying the car is transportation capable yeah, you can't just buy a car and get there. <laughs> There's things you got to do. Yeah, uh, maintenance you have to do, and as well as knowing how to drive and all this other stuff. So, yeah. so I, I like that, and and that's the the perfect point. Any software you put on any machine, you need to have either internally or externally somebody needs to confirm the configurations. And I would wager that uh, many. People, you know, as you mentioned, the business versus home. Mm-hmm. But how many home computers are now business computers? Ooh, gosh. Yeah. So that, yeah, that that does make people kind of get a little queasy. Mm-hmm. Which brings us to the next uh, stat that they tell us about that we have to use in decision making process: mm-hmm. the average time to identify and contain a breach. It's not, it's not pretty, (laughs) you know, identifying it is, let's see, in 20, it's only gone up like a week between the total. It's 212 days to identify it has occurred and 75 to contain it. So the dwell time, as we call it, 212 days. Is the average of how long somebody's up in your business Mm -hmm. before you realize it. 
And the longer they in your business, hmm. I mean, <laughs> the two, worse it gets. Dude, 212 days is, I mean, if somebody's in your computer for more than a few minutes, it's too long. Yeah. 212 days. I mean, they've, they've pitched a tent. They having s'mores. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> now you've got, you got to look under every bit. Every little data bit could lead you it could be the string that, and everybody's like well did they get in and i'm like, do you think they went let's add all this over here and make it obvious that we put these back doors in no they hide them yeah uh, that's but, just terrifying yes and uh the the bigger the issue you know the longer it takes the worse it gets kind of thing mm-hmm so the life cycle, obviously, the longer it takes, where is this? There's a number. If if it's less than 200 days of a life cycle. Okay, so I find them and remediate it. So right now, that's at 287 based on what we just talked about. So that's greater. It's the average cost in U.S. dollars for one that's caught in less than 200 days, 3.61 million. Over 200 days, 4.87 million. Mm. So just when you find it is a you know, dramatic difference in how much it makes it worse. But the breach with a... Incident response plan, which is the best way to make it better. Mm -hmm. If you look at that, if you have just the team, I have a team. I've established there is a team. The cost of the data breach drops to 3.8. Okay. If I've actually tested it. So I can continue down the path. That if I have both a team and a plan, now I'm down to 3.2. If I have neither, it shoots up to 5.7. Mm. And that that's in millions. <laughs> so you're not going to stroke a check. So one of the big things I want to make sure that I do is have an incident response team. And that is not, I will call IT. That is not <laughs> your plan. You need to have a team. You need to know what's going to happen, who's going to call who, everything. And and when you have all of that, then you know you're going to substantially reduce the overall cost. So if I have a team, and at least everybody knows they're on the team, <laughs> <laughs> and we count for everything. I got a fighting chance to contain it faster and cheaper. So I think that that just reiterates it. But this is the very first time that they have looked into the impact of zero trust. Hmm. And they're looking at who's bringing in zero trust. And we've tried to talk about zero trust. But, you know, we need to do like a whole thing on it. But basically, it means you assume traffic's bad until you confirm it's good. Because basically, we do it the other way right now. Yeah. And zero trust is making a big difference, they're finding. Yeah. One of the things I I learned recently was that there's now the ability, and maybe it's been around a little while, but it's the ability to do zero trust on demand. So you can have Mm -hmm. something where... You know, it it's it comes in, it trusts it, but it doesn't trust it always. It trusts it for that one point in time or for a certain period of time. And so um it, I thought that was pretty pretty interesting that it's getting that more that advanced, which is gonna be extremely helpful. Is it cheap? I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> tell you. Yeah, well then that tells you they're not talking about the cost. It's like yeah. when you go to the restaurant and there's no charge, you know, there's no price on the menu. Yeah. That means you shouldn't ask. Yeah. So I, and I and I heard a new term uh, recently zero trust as a service. So um 
you know, it's those things we'll start seeing it filter down. I, I think it's still more of an enterprise level thing. Yeah. And it'll start filtering down and, and we'll start seeing it more in the small business market, small and medium sized business market. But it certainly I think it's going to be a game changer. But like everything in security, we have to understand, you know, how disruptive it's going to be or how much it's going to stand in the way of getting work done and um, and then just uh, make those yeah. decisions. Well, for those that don't like having to deal with a password, can you imagine them having to deal with every bit of traffic? Yeah, and being sure it. it's acceptable, you know. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. And, and you're, and we, and we're getting deeper into areas where, and we're, we're way past this already, really. But you can't own a business with computers and not have competent IT involved. These people that are, you know, I'll just go you know, down to the store and buy stuff when I need it, or I'll just call a guy whenever I need it. I got it. Um, yeah, this, I mean, we're way past that. Sure. You can hook things up and it quote unquote works, but you know, that's the goal is not for your network to function. The goal is to have it to function safely, securely protecting privacy and all that stuff. All that goes hand in hand. It should not be exclusive. Yeah, and, you know, we talk a lot about security, but the whole point of security is to be able to maintain your business, and that requires you maintain the privacy of the information that you have. Mm -hmm. Some data requires more privacy than others, and that's where healthcare comes in play. But Yeah. I mean, it's strictly a, a risk decision, and it's a risk conversation. When you have a business, you're looking at, Everything from, okay, what's the risk of somebody slipping and falling as they walk up the steps to get into the door? What's the, I mean, there's all these other risks you look at. I mean, you, if you got somebody mopping the floor, you're putting out, you know, signs and stuff, trying to, again, reduce the risk of a, an issue happening. This mm -hmm. is no different in IT, but yet as dangerous as it can be in IT, it's crazy how many times people don't even bother to look at. You know, what are we going to do to, to manage these risks to an acceptable level? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't do mind. risk management, then you're fine if you don't manage the risk. You know, what was the quote on I saw on some ad for daredevils? It's like other people uh, are worried about they're afraid to die. We're afraid to live or, you know, something like that or, you know. You know, afraid well, something's you know, not, gonna kill you. Afraid versus, you know, if you're living on the edge, if you don't think that you're, if you think you're risk averse and you don't have like professional IT and an incident response plan and all of that, you are not risk averse. Mm -mm. Well, nay, nay. My opinion is not having a, a risk management plan is your risk management plan. <laughs> True. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you don't get you don't get to say you don't have one. Not having one, that's your plan. You know, not having a response plan, that's your plan. You plan not to respond to it. You're going to just right. sit in the corner, stick your thumb in your mouth, and rock back and forth and hope it goes away. <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. Sorry. Uh, it's not going to happen to me. You know, that's, that's a risk management plan. It's not going to happen to me. Yeah. Oh, so, but and then one final little note to get in on all the people. Speaking of, it's not going to happen to me. Well, those are for big companies. Those numbers are for big companies. That's what it costs big companies uh, oh, when these things happen. If you have less than 500 employees, the average cost of a data breach, $2.98 million. Mm. That's less than 500. Let me reiterate. <laughs> if you have 500 to 1,000, the average cost is down. Because now they've started doing risk management, I guess. I don't know. But it's 2.63. It's, it's not down. It actually went up from 2020, but it's less yeah. than if you've got less than 500 employees. Yeah, it went way up on the less than 500 employees. Yeah. You know, it's 2.35, yep. 2.35, as long as you were under 100. It didn't matter last year. Mm -hmm. And the year before, it was pretty close. But then there's a substantial jump. When everybody mm -hmm. had to, oh, wait, what happened? We all started working from home. Mm -hmm. There was no plan. There's no technology. And just like you said, they're pulling computers out of the closet and dusting them off and connecting. And 
Yeah. Where everybody's just, you know, just use what you have at home. It's the whole like, you know, bring your own device debacle, which I, you know, said before, I thought was the most horrible idea anybody's ever come up with. Yeah, I know. When you start telling people, well, you need to do this, 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 and this with those devices. And they're like, well, our employees don't want us to do that. Then you need to buy them one. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to do that. I know. They want to use what they like. (sighs) Yeah. Had those discussions. And so we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we have to go do another gig, my friend. Yeah, that's right. So we're about to transition this little jig over to the Ransomware Live event that CyberX is hosting. So if you hear this and you saw us last week, just know we (laughs) recorded this before you saw us. There you go. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) All right, folks, that's our show for today. As always, thanks for listening. And remember, for Donna and myself, HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.